I'm good right now, Mark. Okay. Uh, I've just started the recording, so uh, this is for people to be able to watch um, uh, later. Um, and I should I should note that these lectures are now posted on our website, and I'll send you all a link. Um, um, now it looks like Shani and Sue have just arrived, so hello, Shani and Sue. Um, good to have you on board. Okay. Um, so let's talk through pretty quickly um, then uh, what we what we covered some of the things that we covered um, last week or last lecture, and I just want to kind of whiteboard this. Um, so, so let's see. Um, so the first thing is I wanted to I wanted to reiterate we covered some of the lean six sigma. Ooh, hello. There we go. It takes me a while to do this. Principles. Hey, come on, what's going on? Hold on just a second. It's like my uh, pen is not working so well. Whoops. Let's try this again. Sorry about that. Looks like it's still having some problems. I'm just going to have to talk through this because it looks like um, my pen is not uh, is not working. Let me try a different pen. I just uh, I just loaded up with fresh batteries uh, yesterday, so I don't know why this is happening, but uh, we'll try a different one. Sorry about the, the delay here. Apologize for that. Okay, so we talked about some lean six sigma. Well, still some problem principles. It's just not going to work. <laughs> and um, well, let me use the old uh, the old fashioned way. There we go. So uh, we talked about some Lean Six Sigma principles. And, um, and after some discussion, we found that, uh, we found that uh, here were a few of them. Focus on the customer, right? And we're going to call that VOC today, vo obtaining the voice of the customer. So part of Lean Six Sigma is obtaining a renewed voice of the customer. Um, we also talked about uh, making decisions by data. I believe that was Sue's uh, that was Sue's comments. And I don't want to rehash a lot of the things that we talked about, but obviously those are two absolute key tenets of following Lean Six Sigma principles and why we think it brings benefit uh, to a, to a uh, to a business. We also talked about how it operates, and part of that is you need to have process thinking. In other words, or a process lens. We're going to be looking at how things happen, why things happen the way they do, by putting on the sort of process lens. Um, so we think of things as uh, repeated ways of people uh, 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 that people do things that have inputs and outputs, all that kind of things that can be described mathematically by the function that we talked about last time, y equals f of x. And uh, well, I was going to draw up the picture, but it looks like I'm having trouble drawing. Um, um, for one reason or another. I don't know why. Um, um, it's not in the hands. Um, we also talked about, uh, with respect to that, and I think uh, Patrick was the one who brought it up, it's important to go to the process. In other words, it, and, and observe. In other words, if we are going to uh, do fact-based checking and getting data, it's very close to data, but it's a little bit different. And that is, um, uh, it's not just necessarily collecting data from a, a spreadsheet or in a database, but it's also observing and collecting data with your eyes and watching how people behave. That can also that can often tell you just a tremendous amount um, uh, in a process, and it's important that we do it. And, and, and it's something that we don't want to skip. Um, a lot of times, simply observing the process will tell you what you need to do. Um, 
Also, uh, part of this is uh, uh, Brad brought up was end-to-end, -end, um, uh, making sure that we look at the process end-to-end. -end. That's important in a, in, a, in a large way because what we found is that a lot of people who practice process improvement um, end up looking inward. Uh, I call it navel gazing. <laughs> um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later today when we talk about customer focus and we decide who, uh, how do we determine who is the customer or who are the customers, what are their priorities. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that. But having that end-to-end -end view is very key or very critical in making sure that you don't optimize a certain place and make the whole process worse. Um, uh, and that happens, that happens a lot more than you think. Um, and um, I think um, Jim was somebody who pointed out uh, that knowing the business value of what we do is important as well. So again, going part and parcel with what we said before, optimizing certain parts of the process can actually be bad for business if it sub-optimizes the, uh, the entire end-to-end. -end. So knowing what, what are the key objectives is very important. For example, if your main goal is growth, um, I think I gave you an example of a company where I was working which is recently capital funded. They're trying very, very hard to, to double their growth within the next three years, and yet the people working on process improvement projects were mainly focused on expense reduction. Um, that's important. We don't, want to, we don't want to discount all of that, but it may not be the primary uh, objective. If they're cutting costs in order and, and at the same time limiting growth, that's perhaps a bad thing. Um, and then finally, um, we talked about uh, uh, looking for cause and effect. In other words, why? Why do things happen? We don't want, want to simply get results for results' sake but we want to understand why we got those results so that we can repeat them in the future and we can improve them in the future. So those are the, those are the sort of the basic tenets that we talked about last time. It's important to keep those in mind. So when you get lost in a project or anything like that, you know, maybe put them in your, in your cubicle or your office or, 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 or your penthouse or whatever, uh, uh, wherever you are, and, or your hotel room if you're, you're like me, I, I'm on the road a lot, and um, you know, look at it 30 seconds before you brush your teeth at night or uh, something like that. Um, and it helps you, it helps ground you on what you're trying to, uh, on what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so um, that was that. And we also talked a little bit about, um, about the Lean Six Sigma uh, problems that were so to solve. And one of the, one of the sort of powerful paradigms, I guess I would say, is we're going to be looking at either delays. If we can put our project narrative in either, in one of these three things, it's off, these three things are often very, can be very compelling for people. Delays, defects, and variation. And remember, that delays tended to be, if, if we formulate a problem in terms of, oh, this is a process with so many delays, it's, the delays are really killing us. And that's the thing that resonates and motivates our team. That very often, um, lean sort of techniques will come to the fore. Load balancing, making sure handoffs make sense. Again, um, if, if defects are often, are, are the, are the way that we can we feel that we can really motivate our team. Oh, you know what? The problem with this process is it's so riddled with defects. We just need to make sure that we get it right. If if those if that's the primary uh, driver of the narrative, then uh, six sigma techniques are often are often very helpful. Understanding why at at different points in the process why there's rework or why things are being done wrong, and you can see I think. Um, Brad, Brad and I had a discussion earlier um, uh, before everybody joined uh, about uh, discharge of patients. And one could look at the problem from either one of those perspectives. Um, delays could be caused by, for example, uh, admissions data being incorrect and having to go back 
and look at uh, data that was that came from admissions um, that caused the delay. Um, so looking at limiting the amount of time or reducing the defects are both viable ways of looking at the process. However, one may be more compelling to the team, to management, uh, to the customer. Um, you know, so, so we're going to be talking a little bit more through that. And that's pretty typical of, of, of many projects. The third one is variation. So um, variation is, uh, of course, um, the, the idea that what is most compelling here is that the process gives unpredictable results. It's you know, tremendously volatile, and it makes people kind of skittish to participate. Probably the best example um, that we know of that is, is um, the stock market, right? So the more volatile the stock market, the more skittish sort of the ordinary investors become. Um, and that's certainly uh, driven a lot of things. People talk about consumer confidence. You know, people start to pull back on services and, and discretionary spending when they don't know whether it's going to work or not. Um, and there are plenty of, plenty of studies. I, I don't need to go into that ad infinitum. I'm, I'm guessing you're all bought in on that. Um, okay, so those were kind of the, uh, the, the background that I wanted to, to talk about. And um, I also wanted to go through, if you can, um, let's see. I'm going to pick up on our week one slides on slide 92 for just a moment. And um, I don't want to uh, dwell too much on this because I think most of you are already familiar with the DMAIC process. If you're not, um, it, the DMAIC process is the process which Six Sigma and, and I believe Lean projects uh, should also follow. And Lean it may be abbreviated. Um, but um, uh, let's just walk through that pretty quickly. On, on slide number 94, is kind of the oops is the selling points on slide number ninety five is kind of the classic view of demand it's just a definition of what the terms are I want to take you through a pictorial view and hopefully this will resonate a little bit more um, in, in 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 the way that you're thinking about it so let's walk through it in the define in the defined part of the project our objective is to really understand what is the value creating process which departments does it go through, um, who are the key customers, and what are the key metrics that we want to look at in order to obtain uh, and understand how, uh, what, what, what is a good result for this project? What are the best deliverables? In measure, which is the next phase, DMAIC, our, our whole purpose in measure is really to state the current performance of this process. So if everything in this blue box on 96 is our process, then I've, I've, kind, of just, I've kind of just made that a blob here. Uh, so we're just conceptualizing it right now. In your projects, obviously, it won't be a, blo a blue blob or any other color blob. But the idea is we're going to understand what is our current performance on that key output or one or more key outputs. Generally speaking, we'll want to keep it to one or two in a classic improvement project. Uh, in a design project, often there are many metrics that we'll want to optimize. In a classic continuous improvement project, you will do best by uh, choosing one primary and maybe some secondary metrics. And we'll talk a little bit about that further today. Um, the idea is, sim in, in, in simple terms, is to look at the current process and to, to look at whatever the customer specifications might be, like let's say 30-day turnaround time on an invoice. Um, and just look, well, what percentage of times do we make it within that 30-day turnaround time? What percentage of times do we not? That's the simplest way of saying, where do we stand today? Not the only way, but it's the simplest way. Let's go with that for just now. In Analyze, the key thing here is you're going to change I think to I know. So the reasons why your process is performing suboptimally optimally, could be due to hundreds or thousands or dozens anyway of different reasons. Now um, it could be, and, and generally we have certain ideas uh, that we think are the reason why we're getting the performance that we get. In Analyze, 
what we're trying to do is we're trying to change that I think to I know. That's depicted in the, pro in the picture down here. And I need to get my, uh, my cursor back. There we go. My spotlight back. So that's depicted in the, pro in the picture down here by the arrows. So in the beginning, what you're going to try and do is you're going to try and list, brainstorm, what are all the different things that could be driving the performance of this process, right? So if you're talking about, um, uh, if you're talking about, say, a pizza delivery, there's all sorts of things that could be driving it. It could be the cooks, it could be the cooking equipment, it could be the order taking, it could be the driver, it could be the boxing, it could be, did we get the address right, it could be the billing. Lots of different things. And in fact, you know, if this were your process, I'm sure you'd have probably many, many more things. We can brainstorm. Now, all of those things may be viable, but what we're going to do is we're going to look in and say, by observation and by collecting some data, we're going to determine, actually, do they really, in fact, have a statistical effect on the key output? Right? So maybe a key output in our pizza delivery might be the, the delivery, t the time to delivery. Right? And maybe somebody's theory is, well, our cars just simply aren't fast enough, so we're going to soup up everybody's car and get them all, uh, uh, you know, a GTO or something like that to deliver. Um, um, if you're Domino's, probably have a lot of accidents then. But anyway, that might be a theory, and um, you'd gather data if you could and uh, test that theory. Um, so what what really matters are the are the arrows that we've talked about in red. You may find, for example, that the training on the cooks really makes a difference, or the the uh, order taking really makes a big difference because if we get the address wrong, we get the, the whole order wrong and it takes extra time. Okay, so that's the idea, is to change I think to I know. Then in improve, you actually make, suggest, verify, uh, approve, and actually make changes based on your results from the analysis. So because you really know that these things are related, you're pretty darn sure that your improvements are going to work. Okay? It's not just testing out theories at this point. It really is testing out pretty strong hypotheses. We're still a little bit careful, and we're going to run those, and we're going to test them, and we're going to collect some data to make sure they worked. But that's essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to go from a percent defective that's relatively high to a percent defective that's much lower. And that's depicted here by, you can imagine turnaround times if we're doing the pizza delivery. If these were the uh, overall times of deliver before, here's where we are right now. So almost always delivering, say, 18 to 20 minutes, uh, which would be fantastic if it actually happened. Okay. Finally, in control, and this is the key thing. In control, we shift our control of the process from the output in other words, managing the turnaround time, which is difficult. It's difficult to manage turnaround time because uh, also Brad and I were talking about this earlier. Um, generally speaking, in managing the early, uh, in, in managing an output, the, the difficulty in it is um, there's not much you can tell uh, people to do. You can tell people to do their job better. You can tell people to do the job faster. But in managing key inputs, we have much more constructive things that we can do and monitor. So, for example, if we found that training of the cooks in the pizza delivery, uh, pizza delivery example, were very important, or was very important uh, in making sure that we got the delivery on time, then we could check that, right? We could check every month, you know, what's the training level? Do we have anybody that's not trained? If so, we know how to execute on that. Okay? So it makes it into a much more manageable process if we know all the levers. Now, we shouldn't also pretend that we know every single lever just by doing one project. Uh, we want to find the big rocks first. So find the big ones first, then we tweak it and, and make it better uh, once we get those in. Okay? So I want to share that with you in terms of the pictures, uh, all the way from end-to-end -end process, output thinking, starting to understand what are the key drivers, using those key drivers to make decisions about what to do, and then making sure it sticks. Okay? Here's where, and this is one of the reasons why we talk about behavior as well, because at beha in behavior, a lot of this is, is really uh, 
where all of this is going to go, uh, where um, where our processes are really going to to either sustain or not is if we can get the behaviors um, out of people. I'm, I'm not talking about controlling people's lives. I'm saying, you know, if one of the behaviors that we need is to clean the tool room once a week, then we need to make sure that that tool room gets clean once a week. So that's a behavior um, that we that we need to have happen. Okay. So um, so I wanted to cover that. Um, because we didn't get a, a, a chance to uh, to do that last time. Um, uh, now what I'd like us to do is to move forward, and, and, and um, I'd like us to go to uh, slide 120. Now all of this is in your reading assignment, but I'd like to go to, to slide 124. And um, I wasn't planning on talking through this. I was planning to whiteboard it. I'm going to give it one more shot and see if I can do this on the whiteboard. But... Um, it seems to be, for one reason or another, very, very uh, pesky today. So uh, we'll see. Maybe it's a little bit. Now it's still having trouble. Yeah, look at that. I can do it, but it's uh, it just doesn't seem to be doing a, a very good job, a very effective job. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Do apologize. I tested it right before the uh, right before we started, so I'm going to turn that off and um, and uh, we'll we'll just kind of talk it through. Um, mostly, I wanted you to read this section um, and um, and uh, and uh, 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 note a couple of things. This is the in this section we're really talking about the what I would say is the by the book sort of thing so um, so read it over but here's something that you're going to definitely need to do with some degree of delicacy I would say delicacy is maybe not the right word but um, uh, maybe uh, you're gonna need to personalize it somewhat I'll give you an example um, in the objectives in this say, in this uh, section, we're really talking about. I, I, I say we're going to summarize the key elements for team dynamics and team building. This is just very short introduction to all this stuff, um, and that you'll be able to conduct a stakeholder na analysis and run a first team meeting. Well, um, I want to talk through that, and I've got an example of of sort of what um, that ought to look like. But let me let me shoot forward to the for the example for the stakeholder uh, analysis and then we'll talk through the uh, um, the, the first team meeting um, oh as we get going you're going to see the I, I provided something called the demaic navigator to everybody and as we go through this course and you've probably noticed it by looking at the slides already I'm very big on um, understanding where we are in different places. And in the define, uh, and, and so for every section, I've highlighted where these tools and techniques might be most effective or are most often used. It doesn't mean it's the only place where they're used, but it's primarily where they're used. Um, in the navigator that you'll get, and that you, if you've gotten the binder, it should be in the last section, it also suggests specific tools to use at each phase so uh, and to use at each uh, at each place so hopefully that'll help you go back and say okay maybe I ought to consider using this tool or that tool or the other okay so um, so uh, without further ado um, there's lots of good stuff in here about uh, selecting the team and all this kind of stuff um, just very quickly um, one of the things that you should do prior to a um, uh, first team meeting. If we're talking about first team meeting, what I'm really talking about is a kickoff meeting. Okay, so there's a few things that you should conduct uh, prior to that. One of the things is with um, with uh, sometimes key team members, but often a sponsor or champion. Uh, you'll want to talk through um, understanding um, the the. Uh, uh, what is the scope of the project? In other words, what are we talking about in terms of the process step? What are the customers? And so forth. We'll also want to talk through 
who, what other stakeholders are involved. So I've got the sort of by the book um, answers to all these things. Um, here are the, 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 you ought to just start with forming a list of the potential stakeholders and just kind of talk them through. Now, these are real people, right? So you would replace the generic things I've got here with real names. So for example, um, you know, sponsors, definite stakeholders, right? Uh, process owners, definite stakeholders. Sometimes specific customers are definite stakeholders. The team is a stakeholder. Um, um, at a hospital, certainly doctors or nurses or certain employees could be stakeholders. So um, um, a stakeholder is essentially anyone who, um, anyone who stands to either benefit or um, suffer <laughs> as a result of the work that you do on this project. That's who a stakeholder is. Okay? And you want to identify who are some of the key stakeholders. And when I say that, I mean people who may or may not, uh, I'm sorry, will definitely have some influence on the project. So um, for Shani and Sue, uh, for our front-end quoting project that we did, uh, Dan Vaughn was a key stakeholder. Uh, so was Michelle uh, was a key stakeholder. Um, um, that was a sales project, um, and Dan was uh, a, an, a sales operations guy, and Michelle was the head of sales. Those were two people who definitely depended on uh, on the work that we did. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, so it, it, it's not rocket science. It's important to have that sort of talking through who are the stakeholders, and it's nice to have a list. What I've got on the next page is something that you may choose to do or you may not choose to do. Okay, and th again, this is the by the book thing. Uh, by the book, you want to write down who the name is, what the what the role is. Are they a supporter, or neutral, or resistor? Um, and uh, how often do they need to be informed? What's the plan for for if they're a resistor? What's the plan for getting them to buy in? Um, you can do all that, but the reason why I'm saying is take this with a grain of salt is in some cases you don't want to create a paper trail of this. You don't want to definitely share with somebody, hey, you're a resistor, unless they have very thick skin and they're not going to take it the wrong way. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. It's listed here. There is a template that you can use. Um, just use your discretion at that. Okay, that was the one thing I wanted to say through that. Um, okay. Let's let's um, let's uh, move pretty quickly into the uh, the first team meeting, um, and for the kickoff, um, um, which really is the first team meeting, what I found is that a lot of people um, overdo the first team meeting and they try and do a ton of work. What I think is important in a first team meeting is uh, is to keep it relatively relatively uh, small if you can. It's helpful if the sponsor or, a, or, a, uh, or somebody who's an absolute key stakeholder can be there at the team meeting. That's helpful. But you want to go in with knowing who the stakeholders are, having some draft uh, of a charter beforehand, uh, realizing that it may be, you may, that may change. It probably will change. Um, and it's also helpful to understand, I've got a uh, uh, to, to understand sort of maybe what what you think of as the scope uh, is the scope um, and maybe even what the main process steps are okay so those things are are helpful to have coming into a into a meeting uh, coming out of it um, this can vary but you want to have a few things coming out of the meeting one of the things coming out of the meeting is um, you'll want to have a clear problem statement so if you can have a problem statement or objective statement coming out of that meeting, that's going to be extremely helpful. Second thing is you want to have an agreement on, on, um, on meeting times going into the future. So if you come out of that meeting with, a, with an agreement that the team is going to meet at such and such a frequency, that's helpful. It's also helpful if you can have an idea about what will be shown at each of the meetings. If there's other things like a daily huddle, you know, 15 minutes in the beginning of the day where you're going to cover things with folks, 
where it's just going to be information gathering and that's it, or uh, there's no discussion, or there's very little discussion, I should say. That's fine too. Uh, but keep it, keep it, keep it tight if you can. Okay. Um, beyond that, I, I, I'm going to show you. Um, uh, you know, there's there's some other stuff that you can read in here, um, uh, and some ideas about it. And this varies by by teams. Um, some groups, for example, I've got some some uh, some uh, references in here to. Um, I've got some references in here to having an icebreaker. Sometimes that works for people. Sometimes it really does not. So again, use your discretion um, and uh, think about lo the logistics if you can. Um, I like to have flip chart and markers. Uh, I like to have printed out agendas for participants. If you're having lunch at a restaurant or something like that to do the kickoff, uh, have reservations. Um, I also like to have a projector um, if I'm doing the dreaded PowerPoint. Um, uh, slides and so forth. Okay, I think that's about it. There is a template also for your first uh, for your first team meeting. It's just a template, altered as you need to. Okay, so um, so that's all I want. Really want to say about that. The main thing I wanted to kind of segue into is that um, let's let's move into um, slide one forty two. I do apologize for the kind of skipping around, but um, but uh, and and also I really apologize for the technical difficulties I've had this morning. Um, not fun to have those. Um, let's talk a little bit about the project management um, uh, uh, section. So um, in the and I think you'll see why I'm kind I kind of move quickly through the teams because the project management section is really going to cover. I think what we need to cover for that'll handle that first team meeting. So I want to talk through some of that stuff. So if you can move to uh, to slide 142, um, let's let's start talking. Uh, let's talk through. Uh, let's talk through that. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so um, okay. So when we finish this, my my main goal is that we kind of have at least we all are kind of on the same page with respect to what are the different charter items that we need to have in there, and we have some of the tenets of how to write a good problem statement for an improvement project. Now I keep saying these for an improvement project. And I mean, really, a project that's about improvement, not a design project. So we're going to be mostly covering improvement projects in here. Okay, so that's really my two goals of of finishing uh, of when we complete uh, this section. Here's where we are in the in the define, measure, analyze, and improve control cycle. We're really starting from the start. Um, so that's really what we're that's really what we're talking about in our in my paradigm, it's all about making the business case to do this, right? But it has elements of certainly putting together the team, putting together a project plan, all those kinds of things. So uh, uh, without further ado, let's get into it. And before I start, I have all these before I start things, but before I start, let's realize that this is the hardest part. I, I, I'm convinced that after all the projects that I've done, uh, and all the projects that I've reviewed, the beginning is the hardest part because there's so many moving parts. It's hard to get a coherent story, and um, and there's a lot of things that you have to do 10 percent, 20 percent, 50 percent, and then move to something else to get that up to the place where it needs to be. To give you an example, process and customers are two things that are very important, um, but they go together. To understand who are important customers, understanding the end-to-end -end process and what that process is and how we measure it um, is often a, a critical step in understanding who the customers are and vice versa. Sometimes understanding who the customers are is very important to getting the process right. So doing them concurrently and figuring out at the same time is part of the difficulty in the defined phase. Okay? All right. 
And that's all that this says right here. Define in particular tends to be iterative. So you ratchet up the, the macro map is a high level process map. You ratchet up the macro map. Sometimes a lot of teams feel that that's the best, that's the best way to start. Other people feel that, no, we need to understand who the customer is first. That's important. Other people say, no, what's really important is we need to understand the business case and why our business um, needs this project to happen. All of those ought to come together. And if they don't come together, that, that spells trouble for the project. But um, uh, figuring out sort of which one to do first, just you need to dive into all of them concurrently, which is why this is kind of difficult to, to start out with. So let's cover the project management aspects of that, um, and we'll cover essentially charter first. I, I tend to like doing the business case first and understanding things from the business. So let's start with the charter, okay? So I think all of us are undoubtedly familiar with a project charter. Um, and uh, what I'd like us to do is just to take a moment, uh, let's take 30 seconds, and let's Let's, um, you can write down on a piece of paper next to you, what are the elements that you would feel are necessary in a project charter? We all know what a project charter is. It's sort of a, a document, a guiding document for a project team and its sponsor. Uh, I'd like you to take 30 seconds and write down on a piece of paper maybe three or four things that you think are definitely need to be in the charter. Okay? doesn't need to be exhaustive. Let's just get a, let's just get a sense for what's there. So I'm going to shut my mouth for 30 seconds and we'll wait for you to do that. Aha. Okay. So hopefully you've had a little bit uh, of time to do this. Let's let's um Looks like I've got my pen back. Not sure how that happened. But let's talk through what are some key things in the charter that we that we would wanna that we'd wanna definitely keep. Sue, can I start with you? Sure. Um, you'll want to know uh, who's on your team. Ah, okay, excellent. So, uh, team members. Great. That's that's uh, that's very very important. Okay, great. Um, Patrick? Um, the measurement, what it is your, your goal is and how it's going to be defined as far as, you know, moving the quality from X to X. Excellent. Um, I'm going to list those separately, key measurements and key and, and, and goals slash deliverables, right? Okay, great. Great. Um, John, can I put you on the spot and ask you for... Sure. Yeah, I'm going to put on put scope in there. You know, opportunity begins with what and ends with where. Got it. Begin and end. Yeah, excellent. We're going to talk a little bit about scope, but um, it can be more than, than just beginning and end, right? I mean, it can be certain, um, maybe certain customers are in and certain customers are out of scope. Uh, maybe certain IT systems are in, certain IT systems are out of scope. Um, all sorts of things like that can, can be scoped. Super important, absolutely. Okay, Brad? Uh, I had strategic fit as one. Ah, okay, great one. Okay, excellent. And last but certainly not least, Shani? Um. I was thinking, you know, the business case, the why we're doing the project and the problem statement. 
which okay. kind of goes along with the key measures. Yes, it goes along, and it goes along with strategic fit too, doesn't it? Okay, excellent. So, and and I don't think Jim is on uh, today. Um, so excellent. So, um, business case and the problem statement. I think that's a great that's a great start. Um, I'm going to go to uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, whoops to the oh I know what's going on here. There we go. I'll go back to the the slides here and. Um, you know, here's the quote, the book answer, right? So, um, so uh, you know, the book answer here for us is, well, it should have an objective or a problem statement. This is minimal, right? It should have a business case. Um, it should have a project scope or a, a, a key a scope. It should have goals. And it should have the team members, steering team, expectations and responsibilities. And one of the things that I found is very, very helpful and I think the uh, the world is sort of catching up with this view, thankfully, is um, if anybody can remember sort of the mid-90s to the maybe even part of this decade, where when you did a project, the charter was like a, a, a two-month-long exercise, and it was, you know, this massive document that was 15, 30 pages long, uh, where you had, you know, written roles and responsibilities that were to the nth degree. I remember that from working in the defense industry. My personal view is I'd love it to be on like a page. <laughs> if I can have it on a couple pages, that's okay too. But I like to have it on a page or two so it can be communicated quickly and easily. Um, here's an ex here's a, uh, a sort of an outline of what a charter would look like of what such a charter would look like. Here's the first page, right? And some ideas about what are some of the questions that you can ask about this. And we'll talk about some of these things. Uh, specifically about how to get there, but um, certainly a project name. Project has to have a name. Um, and we'll talk. Uh, I won't talk about that, but it is in your notes uh, about you know, choosing a good name for a project. Choose something that's specific and indicates that there's improvement to be made. Um, that's helpful. Um, choosing something that that makes it feel like you can't succeed or that it's uh, not related to what you do is bad. Um, um, Anyway, the project name and project objectives, fairly straightforward. I'm going to show you an example of that in uh, just a moment. Um, a business case uh, summary. One of the things I want to point out here is that in defined phase, you may not have good data yet on the business case. As you go forward, you're going to get more and more data and understanding on the business case. We're going to go into this in much more detail in the next lecture where we're going to talk a little bit about finance, uh, financial calculations and things like that. I, I don't know if it's next, I think it's lecture four actually, where we'll talk about formulating a business case and how to do high, medium, and low estimates and all that kind of stuff. But for now, suffice it to say, it should be a narrative that says, why is this compelling for the business to do? Why do we need to do it? Why do we need to do it now? Why is it important to the customer? Why is it important to this business? Um, so. Um, does it align with the with business initiatives, Hoshin plans? Uh, so, Brad, you probably know about Hoshin, but that that's essentially strategic, um, strategic right. ideas. Um, and then in our goal statements, you know, that's where we can put it in terms of we can sometimes put them in terms of metrics. Uh, other times, uh, other times, um, we'll put it in terms of tangible items being completed. Um, and here are just some, some different questions about uh, uh, formulating project scope as well. We'll talk about that when we get to it as we go through. Um, here's a, a second page of this, and here are some other things that I have found to be kind of helpful. Patrick mentioned measurements. Sometimes we can talk about critical quality measurements. Now, I've listed a bunch of these here. This would be appropriate maybe for a complex design problem. Uh, where you have multiple CTQs. CTQ stands for critical to quality uh, measurements or characteristics. Um, they're simply measurements. We can view them as simply measurements right now. Um, if this were designed for Six Sigma class, we'd go into it more. But right now, you can just think of them as measurements. So um, there's that. Second thing is, um, it's also nice to have sort of a straw or a draft project plan. When is this going to happen? Is it going to be January through June? Is it going to be 
uh, uh, March through June. You know, what is the timeline for completion? When are we basically going to be done measuring, analyzing, etc.? And then uh, maybe even some stuff on the bottom that says here's where we are in the toll gate. Um, and by the way, all of this can be. I'm going to show you an example now before I go into the uh, before I go into the business case. I'll show you an example. Um, of a of a charter. Uh, now you can see I've I've expurgated some of this, um, but you can see it's it's basically we've kept it pretty similar to to uh, to uh, the the paradigm. Um, this happened to be for a company. This was for a wholesale grocer um, who. Um, um, uh, and and we were working we're working we were working <laughs> with their audit team, and uh, they were auditing way 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 too many boxes and counting too many boxes, and they were doing it in a non-random fashion. So um, that was basically our project objective was to right size the credit um, the standard credit audit for all customers and facilities, and adjust the number of audits to maintain significant statistical significance without oversampling and maintain a random sampling method that's transparent, repeatable, and maintains the data integrity coming from the audits. And we want to implement a staffing plan to capture labor safe, <clears throat> not adversely affect uh, shrink um, or shrinkage. That's a product that goes into the warehouse and somehow doesn't come out. Uh, and, so, and so forth. So this was a uh, this was a charter that happened early on. Later we tightened up that problem statement quite a bit. Um, and so forth. This was a this was a uh, done after a pilot run, so this was something that was to be done in many many facilities. Okay, you can see, uh, and 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 here's what some of the scope is. We'll talk about we'll talk about that. But you can see it has scope. It has a business case uh, summary. Uh, it has a customer benefit and it has a company benefit. We've kept that uh, separate, um, and uh, and so forth. And this was all vetted with. Um, to the project sponsor, even to the executive VP, um, to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, so that's just a, a quick view of, of what that um, looked like. And while we're on the first team meeting, uh, part of part of that was um, actually creating a um, a weekly update, um, a weekly update for the team as well. And I want to show you that because that that shows a little bit more about what we handled or how we handled uh, for this particular team um, uh, communications. And these were done in a in a fifteen to, to thirty minute meeting. Um, this happens to be for two seven two thousand and eleven. You can see, but this was essentially what we walked through every week with the sponsor. Um, um, we simply talked about a summary of the week's progress and overview, we did an overview of the schedule, uh, put a bullet list of what we need to do and reviewed data, and then went through the project charter to make sure it was still it still made sense. So um, some of these elements in many in in some projects you could put on the second page of a charter. For example, um, I'm going to skip past the the, the process uh, summary here. But here's a schedule that we would create. So we created a picture that said, here's what we need to do. Here's what we haven't done. You can see there's some yellow on there, which we're clearly communicating. Hey, we're behind there. It's risk, but it's under control. Uh, but we, we are behind. It's at risk. Um, and uh, we're on plan for all the green items, but we're behind on, and we've completed the, uh, the, uh, the blue items. And we've also bulleted out, here's the client meeting. This might be a second page on a charter or it might be separate. We, we chose to keep it separate in this one. Okay, and then reviewed some data. Here's the bullet list. Uh, here's some data. Uh, here's some detailed data. And then here's a review of the, of the charter again at that point. This was for a slightly different, this was for a slightly different uh, project. Um, so um, that was for a slightly different project. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to show you that to give you a flavor of uh, a lot of people say, well, we can't communicate all that in a half hour. It actually is pretty straightforward to do um, and important if you can make it as much as much pictorially and, and single page as possible. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to move on just uh, to um, uh, 
well, first of all, I want to ask, are there any questions at this point? I'm happy to, happy to talk through any questions you may have. Everybody has their own way of, of doing charters, um, so I think it might be helpful to kind of talk through a little bit uh, what are some of the things that you've seen and said, you know, here's what I like about what you said, Mark, here's what I don't like about what you said, or here's how I would modify it. You know, I'm always open to suggestion on that. I do find that it's important to find something that works for the team. You know, and here's just my suggestion, that's it. Okay. Uh, if you have any comments as we're going through this, feel free to voice them, please, uh, and question. Uh, always like questions. Okay, let's move on. I want to talk a little bit about the business case and um, and um, um, we'll talk more about this as we go on. Um, uh, next week. But essentially, a project charter without a business case um, is difficult um, and, and, and it's problematic. So you'll want to at least have some business narrative about why we're doing this project, why we're doing it now, and how does this align with our other business initiatives. If possible, provide a high-level estimate uh, of of the project financial gains, of the, of the financial gains coming from the project or estimated from the project. It may not be possible to do that in tremendous detail right now, but it will pay dividends uh, the more that you can do that uh, effectively. Again, we'll talk more about that next week when we, do, when we review some financial uh, uh, calculations and, and estimation. Um, but for now, uh, we want to create a narrative. So here's, a, here's an example of I just want us to focus a little bit on the example down there. Um, um, so here's an example of uh, one, in one project charter, um, and, and if we keep it uh, for this one, for example, for a narrative, if we keep it fairly high level, um, it can be evaluated for what are the things that are important and what are not, and and um, and, and as we get more data, we can see which you know which levers are going to be the most important. But anyway, here, I'll just read it through. So getting to the root cause of some rejects will lower the unit cost of, you can see it was wordsmithed a little bit, will lower the unit cost of packaging, improve the turnaround time for correctly packaging all parties, and improve customer satisfaction for two higher pri high priority customers. Positive effects include reduced capacity needed for adjustments, less manual work and non-value added work, quicker turnaround times, more proactive possibilities for adjustments. Now, we're not saying the value of each of those yet. We're not quantifying that. But we're standing it up in front of management to say, are, are you in agreement that this is why we're doing this project? If you're not, now's a good time to say, hey, we're not. This happened to be for an uh, online university um, a project for putting together financial aid packages. That's what it was. So that's why it's called uh, packaging. It turned out, as the project progressed, this was a highly successful project worth, uh, worth multi-millions of dollars to them over uh, three years, um, that um, the amount of freed up capacity, they had 35 people doing this, they freed up basically 20 people. Um, uh, just incredible, uh, incredible gains that came from that. Um, and it made it was just so much more transparent afterward as well. So it made it really set the stage for continuous improvement. But that's jumping the gun. Right now you want to put in that narrative. Okay, let's talk a little bit about project scope. Um, and um, so, uh, and one of the reasons why when we talked about this early uh, earlier um, with project um, with the project scope. Um, that uh, sometimes you, uh, ha understanding the process, as, as John said, is very, very helpful. Um, sometimes understanding the product or services that are included or not included is very, very helpful. Sometimes um, understanding the business units that are included or not included is very, very helpful. They're all kind of in there. Here are just some very uh, broad questions that you can ask going into that. But the key is to really think about how do I want to segment things and uh, what's in and what's out of scope. I like to start by putting everything in scope 
and and then saying and then having people say, well, should it be in? Should it be out? Um, here, here's a tool that we often use uh, called an in-scope, out-scope tool. It's a, and what it is, is it's a visual method to define the project scope. Uh, Shani and Sue, um, uh, you remember that when we did the scope originally, we put it into the charter, but then we also worked pretty hard to put that into a pictorial form. Uh, I'm not going to share that one. I thought it was a good one, but I'm not going to share it because um, it needs to be sanitized quite a bit um, uh, to, to, to sort of make it generic because um, there were some inside, uh, I would say, proprietary things. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is making it a picture is very helpful. The, the idea is you simply brainstorm all the things that are either in or out using the questions that are here. What are our constraints? Who are the customers? What are the processes or products that are important or services that are important? What's the beginning? What's the end? All those are great questions. Um, the one on here is, is the product expected to be world class? That's usually a design question. Um, um, okay, let me show you an example. Instead of, instead of kind of talking about this or talking through this anymore, I want to show you an example of this, and I think that will help flesh it out. So let me show you an example. Um, here's an example of, and I'm going to stay with that same project, the auditing project um, that we had, the food wholesaler. Um, so here was one that I started with, and I sent it to um, uh, a couple of the key people on the team. Um, here were the things that were in, we envisioned um, uh, doing things in three, in three phases. Um, one was putting together what we needed to do, sort of like stop the bleeding. Um, and the others were creating a learning lab and getting us to the next level. Um, and um, in any case, here were the things that, um, here was my ideas. Um, um, and you can see that here are the more basic things, statistically appropriate sample size. You can see that this is lined up with the problem statement that we had before. Uh, putting together a facility error rate visual board, uh, basic root cause training, interpreting audit results, patterns and trends, communicating uh, invoice results and, uh, and insights, creating a learning lab, doing 100% invoice audits. Invoice audit is a more detailed audit. They, they did some very bad, they had some very bad auditing procedures that were yielding poor data. So an invoice audit was a better type of audit. But here are some things that were clearly out of scope, uh, using a segue to get up and down the aisles in the warehouse. Um, that was not something that we were going to check on uh, right away, using wands or scanners. Um, you can see there's a lot of technology that's there. OK. Um, I want to show you, after I sent it out, <clears throat> I got a response from a couple of people. And then I incorporated things to be sort of the second stage. And you can see that it's even beyond, um, beyond the, uh, beyond the uh, corners in that. So I didn't spend a lot of time prettying this up at all. But you can see that people were saying, hey, I'm missing this. I'm missing this, Mark. Shouldn't that also be in the project? And hey, there's a bunch of, us of just do-its that we need to get in the project, and that needs to happen. There's also some things that are outside. And developing the picture that's here is now helpful, because now we can point to specific things and say that's out of scope or that's in scope. Okay, So the more specific that you can get on this, the more helpful it is. I like to do these sorts of things and in, in, uh, create PowerPoint uh, uh, artifacts out of this so I can stand it up pretty quickly, um, even put it into a team meeting uh, if need to, or a stakeholder meeting, a steering team committee meeting. OK. So those are just a couple of examples about the scope statements. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about project title. I'm not going to talk about it here. You can read about it here. Just choose a title that's going to make it easy to sell the project outside and sell the project to your team and motivate them. That's the idea. OK. Um, I'm on slide 156 now. Um, and let's talk through uh, one of the key elements of, of a charter, and that's a problem statement. Um, and this is something that I've noticed that a lot of black belts, a lot of green belts kind of get wrong. Um, so I want to take some time to go through this. A 
problem statement is an evolving statement. It starts out fairly broad and reflects the and, and reflects what you know when you start, and it should be tightened up as you go through a project. Um, but what it isn't is a solution statement. Okay, I want to make that clear. These are projects where we don't know the answers about what we're going to do. We know that we're going to improve turnaround time or lower the number of defects, but we don't know how we're going to do it yet. So we want to make sure that we don't bake in solutions into the, into the problem statement. So just shortly, it's a concise one or two sentence description of what's currently causing pain. Maybe a pain statement is another way of thinking about it. And this pain, the pain should be in three different areas. Uh, first of all, it should be the business, which is generally cost, but not always. could be lost customers. The second is customers. There should be something about the pain to the customer if, if it's important to the customer. And then sometimes it's pain to the employees. So if you're doing an employee satisfaction project or if a particular project is really important to a certain segment of the employees, say at a hospital nurses, nursing staff or at um, um, uh, Shan Yin Su at, at your company, maybe the um, maybe the call center folks or the people who are on the phones um, um, uh, dealing with uh, the membership, um, they might be also uh, experiencing a lot of pain from the current systems. So that's there. Um, and it should be refined as it goes through the project. Here's an example and a characteristic of some good problem statements. So. Here's an example. Since October 2011, our customer return rate on product ABC has grown from 0.5% to 3%. This has resulted in an average rework cost of X dollars. Now, I've left it at X dollars, and in the beginning, you can leave it that way, and a decrease in customer satisfaction. It can just be a factual statement. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it's helpful if you have a number there, like in terms of that cost, but if you don't, that's okay, too. Um, um, it's also helpful if you have that uh, baseline statement that says it's grown from it's gone from 0.5 to to 3 percent. That's helpful. Um, you may not have that at, at this point, so you if you need to leave X percent to Y percent, where Y is greater than than uh, than X, that's fine. Here are some key things about this problem statement, however, um, that are helpful. First of all. It provides dates, right? So it says, when did this problem start? Can't always pinpoint that, but it's helpful if you can. Okay, that's going to help us to understand what data do we need to collect for the baseline. Second thing is it identifies a clear and quantifiable metric. Here we've got customer return rate on product ABC. It's specific, too. You might be able to use that as a key metric on which to judge the deliverables or the success of the project. Third thing is it expresses pain in terms of cost and customer set. It does help define the scope of the project, right? It, it says, hey, this is its customer return rate on ABC product. It doesn't contain jargon or undefined acronyms. One thing that I hate when I read a problem statement is when I can't read it. <laughs> I read it and it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I use what is called the, uh, I call it the mom test. And people said that was a, that was a uh, sexist remark because I wasn't saying the mom or the parents test. So I guess you should call it the parents test. Uh, I, uh, my mom was, uh, uh, I, I had a father who died young. So, um, so my mom was the only one around. So I related more to my mom. And the thought was that if I, if I told my mom what it was that I was working on and she understood it, then I'd know it was probably a good problem statement. Um, the most important thing is it doesn't have any proposed solution. No solutions are allowed in the problem statement, okay? So, so that, that, those are all key. The number one issue I've seen with, I think I've got my, uh, my phone going crazy here. Okay, let me turn that down. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the number, absolutely number one issue with problem statements is that they have, the, they have solutions embedded them, within them. So I want you to reduce, reduce that. The other thing, other, some other issues, or just resist that if you can. The other issue is tons of, sometimes I see problem statements where it's, it's like a page long because they put all this different background information. Uh, you know, here's the, the case history of this. That's all fine. If you want to do that, you want to put that on a separate sheet, do that. But keep it concise so that the team can look at it and say, ah, 
defects on ABC, that's what we're trying to reduce. I get it. It's getting bad. It's gotten bad since December of 2011. I get why it's bad. I understand it. Here's our goal, is to improve that. Okay, keep them on track. All the background about why we think it happened and all that, we don't need to put that in. Uh, sometimes it's really vague. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. And one last thing is please avoid this. Don't put blame in a problem statement. Um, that's, a, that's, that's, not, that's just a big no-no. You're just asking yourself for trouble if you assign blame in that. So, so don't try and say it's anybody's, uh, it's anybody's fault. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bad way to do it. Okay. Um, you can read through this, and that's fine. You can capture it in your notes. But um, it should be used throughout the project. I'll just point out that uh, in defining measures where we're going to be primarily uh, really looking at it, but you can use it throughout the project. And then control, it's very helpful to look at your problem statement on the charter and, and, and gauge, hey, did we achieve the goals that we needed to or not? Okay. I'm not going to talk through too much on our goal statements, but if you want to write a goal statement, um, you can use the questions that were in um, that were in the charter uh, that we had, the straw charter that we had before, or you can look here and just think about uh, the fact that it's a turnaround of the problem statement. In some ways, it's just turning around that problem statement, saying, um, "Here's what we're going to achieve and when." Okay. So if our problem statement is we're going to reduce defects on ABC, a goal statement might be reduce, reduce defects on ABC from X to Y by such and such a time. It can simply be that. Or under such, such and such a budget. That can be reasonable as well. Again, it shouldn't say exactly how you're going to achieve that. It's just the goal of what you're trying to achieve. Same sort of thing. No jargon, no metrics, uh, so forth. I like to have all three lined up, and it's amazing how, how often they don't line up. <laughs> uh, so one way of thinking about it would be to say, let's, let's go with a defects, right? So if I want to reduce defects on ABC product, if that's my problem statement, my, or my problem statement is since, two, since December of 2011, the defects on product A, B, and C have gone from 0.5% to 3%. That might be my problem statement or the, the straw of it, straw outline. The goal statement would be reduce it. <laughs> reduce uh, errors or the defects on product ABC from X to Y by, let's say, July 2012. And my metric then ought to be defects, <laughs> the defects for ABC. So there, are, it, it's all lining up, all three. It's, a, it's shocking how often you'll find something like, uh, I want to reduce the, the problem is we have all these defects my, and, my, and uh, my goal is to drive customer satisfaction and my me my key measurement is turnaround time um, uh, don't do that <laughs> look at all three see that they line up that's why it's also good to have the one page charter because you can look at the problem narrative you can look at the goals and the metrics all on the same page and they all line up okay we all know that but now I've said um, you're probably already familiar with SMART goals, so I'm not going to repeat that. Everybody has their own acronym. This is mine, but um, it's a nice checklist to use. Here's, a, here's an example of a goal statement. Reduce customer return rate for product ABC from 3% to X% percent by July 31st, 2009. Okay. Okay. So um, two of the exercises that I've given you are uh, on problem statements um, in, your, um, in your assignment. Let's just take a moment. And I'd like you to evaluate the problem statement right here. Let's just take 30 seconds and, um, and uh, read the problem statement over and, uh, and think about any suggestions that you might make. Um, as a helpful hint, you might want to just simply turn to slide 157 and go through each of those bullet points and ask the question. Well, a good one provides dates. Does this provide dates? A good one identifies clear and unquantifiable metric. Does this do so? So just take a moment and go through this particular problem statement on 163 and uh, we'll walk through it together. 30 seconds. Write down anything you think of.
Okay, let's just kind of walk through it quickly. So I'll open the floor to anybody. Um, uh, um, uh, if I have a volunteer, um, let's just talk. First of all, uh, clearly you should be saying this is not a perfect problem statement. It's got problems in and of itself. Um, uh, what are some of the problems with this problem statement? Does anybody want to be a volunteer and, and talk through some of those? Yeah, I like the term skyrocketed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, real descriptive, isn't it? <laughs> but technically, that the missile launched by the North Koreans also skyrocketed, but wasn't what they wanted. <laughs> That's true. It's a good point. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we can... The, oh, go ahead. The operational costs not being very clear scope of, of what they're looking at. Yes. It's a pretty broad I think the time period is not very well defined. Yep. Yep. Some people have even pointed out, well, shouldn't we actually say what last year is? <laughs> I would agree. Yeah. This is a pro I mean, generally speaking, this is a problem statement that is way, way, way too vague. Um, it's just not specific enough. Okay. Let's take on... Um, uh, good. So uh, I think you can go through each of those um, as part of the exercise and... Um, uh, and uh, and do that. That's in the black belt, not the green belt exercises. Just to point that out. Um, let's take a moment and just look through, read through this one, and we'll talk through what are maybe some of the problems with this as well. So take another 15, 20 seconds and read it through and see if we have any problems with this. Okay, um, I'll ask for another volunteer who can point out something that uh, is maybe not so optimal about this problem statement. Hi, Mark. Um, I think that with Thanks. this one, there are um, there's root causes and solutions included in in the statement. Uh, how so? Well, because they're talking about that uh, we have multiple redundancies, so obviously that's you've root caused that out and you've determined that through data somehow. Um, our mm -hmm. process is not standardized um, and we continue to have many uh, manual steps. Again, an assessment would need to be done in order to determine if that is in fact true. Um, and then of course the, the mm -hmm. another root cause is that it, it resulted from a system change from the last year. Right. Right. Now, this is the, absolutely, so this one is just riddled with the here's why it's happening, here's why it's happening. Now, if you already know that the, that it's because uh, we have too many manual steps in place, then maybe that's what the project is. Really, it should be instead of having a DMAIC project, just make it an IT project and automate, right? If that's really the problem. Um, on the other hand, uh, it may not be. So yes, I agree. I, I, I think it's it's really locked in, and it's it's got it's got solutions written all over it. Um, the three solutions are really, hey, it's because it's all redundant, and it's because it's not standardized, and it's because we have too many manual steps. <laughs> and it also has the blame in there, doesn't it? <laughs> it's actually blaming that last IT team that went in and made the system change and the software upgrades. Um, so it's, it's, it's failing on a lot of accounts. Now, if you were a team member on this project, and you had to operate by looking at some data, well, how do you operate? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to reduce redundancies? Are you trying to standardize the process? Maybe that's what the goal is here in this project. Um, maybe it's reduce manual. Uh, maybe it's reduce manual steps. The problem here is clearly locking into too many things. Okay. So um, and and it also doesn't have. It also is missing some things, which I will leave you to to complete in the assignment. Good. So. Um, Problem statements, very easy to write poor problem statements, tough to write a good one. So do take some time to do it. Make sure you vet it uh, with, the, uh, with the project leaders um, or the, and the sponsor um, to make sure it's not something. Because, you know, sometimes people have egg on their face with this and they don't want to show it. Um, 
Uh, other times, they, they're comfortable with that. Um, it's certainly better to work with some with a leader who is comfortable with knowing that he or she is not perfect, and uh, but wants to make things better and, is, and has an open mind. Um, but that's not always a hundred percent the case. So just just make sure that it's something that you can stand up at every meeting and and, and really kind of go through and motivate the team with. Okay. So those are some suggestions for writing good problem statements and goal statements. Okay, exercise three is kind of left for you in your uh, in your project, but I want you to scope the the project that you've got and actually use the scoping tool. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, that's basically all we wanted to cover in this particular project management uh, section. Elements of the charter absolutely must have. Got to do it. How to write a business case at this point? We're just talking about the narrative. Why it's important to the business? Why it's important to customers? Why you should do it now? Um, why, if you don't do it, it, it may cause problems. Um, how to write a good problem statement uh, and, and introduce you to that scoping tool. That's really what we wanted to do in this. Um, okay, before, as we move on, I'm going to move on to customer focus. And um, that starts on slide 167. But before I do, what questions do you have that we can address right now? Remember, you can always call me. Um, and, uh, and we can always talk about it in our one-on-ones as well. So uh, at the moment, uh, what questions do you have? Okay, um, I'm going to move on then. Let's talk a little bit about customer focus. Um, sometimes we'll call, we'll call in, in, in our, um, this is a term that's now really catching on, but in, in our biz, in the, pro, in the process improvement biz, customer focus is called obtaining the voice of the customer. That's the jargon that we use um, to say that we're including the customer in what we do. Um, what we're going to talk about um, uh, in this section is really to, first of all, um, talk about who are your customers. Okay, So when we talk about the customer, that is such a... Uh, a generic thing, but it is important for us to define out who really, or for us to, to talk about who really are the customers for this particular project, and what are their priorities. Um, even though we hate to say this, certain customers tend to can be more important than others. Um, so we'll talk about that. I want to very very briefly describe methods for collecting customer feedback uh, because. I think you're already familiar with most of them, and I just want to touch on a couple of points. And then I want to talk about three different tools um, that you can use to help determine the voice of the customer. And these are prioritizing tools, and they're focusing tools. At the end of this, um, those three tools are the Kano model. I'll just kind of highlight them right here. I guess I'll use my highlighter. The Kano model right here. Okay the CTQ tree, and the VOC matrix. Um, now, the Kano model really is a model. It's a model for picturing what are the high priorities, what are the low priorities. And let's fix the things that are the high priorities with respect to the customer. The second thing, the CTQ tree and the VOC matrix are meant to help you get, help you develop customer-focused metrics. You may already have a customer-focused metric. If you don't, this can help you develop one. Maybe it can help you develop a better one if you have one already. So um, that's that's what we're going to be doing um, in this section. Now I'm going to move pretty quickly. There may be a few things that we would will continue next with next week uh, if we don't complete, uh, for example, the VOC matrix. This is something that we can do on Tuesday of next week. I don't think there's any homework that depends on it. Uh, homework assignment uh, that depends on it. Um, uh, but it is a nice little technique. Uh, for Shani and Sue, that's, it's a QFD, but it's simplified, uh, very simplified. Here's where we are in the DMAIC process. So we've, we've made the business case. We're going to link to the customer now. Uh, you'll see that it overlaps with a number of different things. Um, okay. So let's start out with, first of all, who are your customers? Um, and I want to talk this through a little bit because... Um, because um, uh, this is something that can get uh, that can get a little bit uh, that can get a little bit um, 
oh, I don't know, iffy or contentious or anything like that. So let's start out from the uh, from uh, from, um, from the who are the customers. So the very very high level. First of all, we need to define what is a customer. I, I'm just going to put this out and use Deming's definition. of the customer is anybody who benefits uh, from from your service or product in any sort of direct or indirect way. That's a very high level answer and sometimes it makes sometimes it's easy to define what a customer is, sometimes it's not. Okay? That's high level. If we want to get to a deeper level, here's the typical way that people talk about it. Well we have internal and I'm just going to pretend that I have this dialogue. Well we've got internal customers and we've got external customers. Okay. Now, an external, an internal customer is anybody who is generally the next step in the process, and an external customer is anybody who will pay dollars or are end users for this. So, in, in typical example, um, an external customer is um, at uh, Connecticut, uh, the the insurance company would be a member. Okay, so a member is the person who's an insured an insured member, or another external customer would be an employer group. At a hospital, an external customer would be the patient. Okay, internal customers, on the other hand, would be anybody who uh, who is indirectly that. Uh, I, I'm sorry, who is uh, uh, part of the part of the process, right? So um, uh, it could be employees. It could be uh, it, uh, it could be um, certain vendors if you have things going out that are outsourced and coming back in, so th that that can be that can be done as well. Um, what I would like to suggest, and I, and I do this, I've taken it out because uh, of the slides because um, because there's some people who don't like it. <laughs> I'll be blunt. Um, but um, I'm going to share with you this, and um, the reason is because I think it's helpful to talk through sometime. So the way that I learned it that I thought was very, very helpful was that there are three types of customers, end users, and there's a reason I'm writing it this way, brokers, and fixers. So if we look at, and the reason, the reason why I find this helpful is that in many, many companies, brokers end up driving a tremendous amount in the short ter to medium term for the company. So let's do, for example, in the auto industry, here are some examples of this. So an end user is us, right, a, buy, a consumer. A broker in the auto industry might be the dealer. A fixer, well, that's <laughs> that's the auto shop, right? Okay, so so all of that makes sense. At a hospital, I'm just writing this out, and I, I could have other, I could have some of this wrong, but here we've got patients, and there's multiples too, but I'll, I'll just list some of the main ones. Uh, who might be a broker at a hospital? Any thoughts? A physician. Okay, there may be others as well. A nurse may be a broker. Or a vendor might be a broker. Right? If somebody uh, is operating the, uh, the facilities for the operating rooms, they could be a broker. And then uh, fixers. Well, in a lot of cases, we're talking about like admin and so forth. So fixers are fixers that fix the product. I guess it could be, uh, certainly uh, physicians could be listed here as well in some cases. Nurses, etc. Okay. And, and, and to go on, and, and uh, just to kind of complete, complete this, um, in financial services, um, an end user would be a policyholder.
and the broker might be uh, an agent and the fixers might be the internal office. Now, one of the reasons why I find this distinction to be helpful is because um, in a lot of cases, simply listing it as internal or external doesn't do the job of communicating what's really important. However, listing whether somebody is an end user or a broker or a fixer can sometimes help us refocus on end users if end users need to be refocused on. So let me give you a, a very clear example. Um, in a number of financial services, in one of the financial services companies that I worked with, um, they have, and, and I don't know if, if anybody has experience with this, but um, in, in financial services, the agent is king. Everything is done for the agent. And in fact, if you're a policyholder, Good luck <laughs> to you, right? Because everything is really done through the agents. So sometimes refocusing on, hey, it's really the policyholders who bring in the bacon for us, not the agents, um, is is helpful. Sometimes it's not. Um, <clears throat> the, the, um, if you can think about some of the main problems that some of the industries have had in the in the past, you can actually articulate them pretty well in terms of misunderstanding who is the customer. So this. This, I find, is one method that can help us understand who are the important customers. Um, an exam a very clear, clear example is given in the auto industry time and again, where they confuse the dealers as the, uh, as the primary customers. Um, in the long run, generally speaking, in, in just about every for-profit business, the consumer uh, is, the one who's the, is, the, uh, is the one who wins in the long run. So um, just something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, the other thing I would point out is that in many cases when we start to do, and this is one of the reasons why I like to talk about the customer before I talk about the process, is in many Six Sigma projects, I'm going to just draw this, if this is our end-to-end -end process, and here's a few process steps in between, right? So we could say that, oh yeah, our internal customers are the people that are at these transition points. And here's our end-to-end, -end, right? Here's our end-to-end, -end, but our internal customers are at these transition points. A lot of Six Sigma projects don't start out by, by saying, you know, what's going on here? What are the problems here? They start, in fact, by going to, well, let's have a sensing session. Let's talk to everybody here and talk to the people that are the employees and see what the problems are. Well, what you get here is very often a myopic view. Sure, these are problems, and they can be, in many, many cases, they're operational problems. But if you start here, you run the risk of doing something that optimizes here, but sub-optimizes here. And, you know, that's just, that's just why it's important to do. So we like to start out here, and I just wanted to point that out. Uh, one of the, in, in the key project that I've been going through today, the uh, wholesale grocer and the auditing team, I swear, all of their behaviors were dictated by they didn't know who they worked for. They thought that they worked for the trucking company because uh, these auditors, they were doing everything on the trucking company schedule. They were being so influenced by when the drivers were coming in and when they were leaving. Um, and the trucking company was doing all sorts of things like hiding invoices so that they wouldn't, uh, so that they wouldn't get audited, uh, all sorts of things like that. So a lot of it was kind of refocusing the team on okay, who do we work for and who's the customer? It's not the trucking company. It's not those people in dispatch. It's the, pe it's the people at the uh, grocery stores who are stocking the shelves and ultimately the consumers who are buying the food as well as you know, your management. Um, so just taking that step can often be very, very helpful and having people sort of diagramming out where are they? Are they a, a end user or a broker? Um, it's often very helpful. Anyway, I just want to point that out. Okay. Um, let me go back to, uh, let's see. Oh, I see. There we go. Okay. Um, so I want to talk through a little bit of, uh, about the customer data and what are some ways of getting customer data. Um, um, 
So just as a uh, just as a uh, point out there, please do yourself a favor and get some customer data once you've determined who are the customers uh, or who are the key customers. Do yourself a favor and get some customer data, one way or shape or form. Um, um, we'll talk about some advantages and disadvantages, but anyway, here are some here are five ways of getting uh, the customer data. First of all, you can get it from a complaints database. Um, and, and by the way, all of these are, are specified and there's more that you can read in terms of all the rest of these about the advantages and disadvantages on slides 173 through 177. Uh, but I just want to talk it through. So um, in customer complaints, um, uh, you know, there are some advantages. It's often very easy to get and often tells you uh, in some cases what the root cause may be. Some things that you need to look out for when you're just using complaint data is uh, sometimes the squeaky wheel gets, you know, what's the saying? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Well, it may be not the most common thing. It may be just somebody who's a, a, a real crank who's, who's talking about it. It may not be the most systematic problem that you've got. So just be wary about that. Um, and it also doesn't necessarily, re necessarily represent a complete voice of the customer. Um, Direct contract, uh, contact is another way of getting it. And the typical ways are either interviews or focus groups. Um, so um, it's hard for me to not pay attention to the, the people talking here. Um, so um, interviews and focus groups. There are some real advantages to doing interviews and focus groups. The main thing is you get rich information. So you can ask questions, you can ask follow-up questions, and you can get a real a robust response. Um, there are some issues with that, but generally speaking, very, very powerful um, and often very good as a first stage. So I'm, I'm going to get out of this one because it's starting to drive me crazy. Um, uh, it's often very good as a first stage getting voice of customer. Why? Well, because you can get this rich data and you can get a good picture of the lay of the land. One thing that you probably don't want to do is zip out a 10,000 person um, survey uh, when you don't even know what the key elements of the, of the voice of the customer might be. So starting out with an interview is a good way to do it. Um, having said that, there are some disadvantages of interviews and I um, just want to talk through them. First of all, they're costly. So to conduct an interview, it takes a lot of time from the person who's doing the, the interview to the person who's not, uh, I mean to the person who's being interviewed. Um, so it's costly. The second thing is, it's very, very difficult to keep clear from bias. Now, all data collection has bias. And in fact, that's true at the absolute physical level. There's something called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle that in layman's terms simply means that when you measure something, you disturb it and therefore affect the measurement. Okay, So that's true at the very base physical level. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's true at the macro level too. There's all sorts of uh, uh, bias on interviewers and interviewees. So a couple of different things are with interviewers. Um, uh, interviewers can have their own biases. Um, they can bring, they can ask leading questions. Uh, they can bring their own thoughts about what the answer should be uh, to the table. So you want to uh, mitigate that a bit by having questions sort of written down and, and maybe having people walk through the questions beforehand. That can be very helpful. Interviewees also have um, their own biases that they bring to the table. Um, two good examples are um, sometimes they're telling the interviewer what they think they want to hear. That happens a lot. Like if I asked, um, um, you saw, you know, you've all seen my, my, uh, my face now <laughs> and you know that I have very short hair. If I ask people, what do you think about men with short hair? Um, for the most part, uh, people are going to be nice to me and say, oh, I like short hair, even if they don't. So it's probably not going to be a, a, a good, uh, a reliable answer. Um, but other things can happen, too. Um, they can give you, um, it can vary, their answers can vary when you ask, uh, when, it, when there are different people in the room. So if you want to interview somebody about a process, it stands to reason that you don't want to have their boss sitting next to them because if you ask them about times and volumes and things like that and what's hard and what's easy, they may not be truthful. So um, you know, just be wary of that. Um, 
and customers are, are the same way. Third thing is you can often ask customers a question and if they don't know the answer they're going to give you an answer anyway. So uh, 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 in one classic example that I saw um, a interviewer asked, um, this was a uh, an assessment of, of um, what people felt about foreign affairs, certain foreign affairs. And one of the questions was, are you sympathetic or, or not to the uh, plight of the, um, of the natives on, of the native population on Alpha Centauri? So, uh, uh, and the native human population on Alpha Centauri. Now, if anybody is, is with me on this, Alpha Centauri happens to be the nearest star. So we absolutely knew nothing about the population on Alpha Centauri, except that it probably doesn't even exist. And yet, most people answered in the affirmative that they were certainly in, in favor of the, of, the, of the human rights for people living there, even though there were no people living there. So uh, not, not a problem to, to answer that. Um, um, and there's, there's actually a, a, a joke that I recall um, that it, the modern version of that is uh, something about Bill Gates. So Bill Gates goes for a valet parking at a, at a restaurant and he pulls in and, and the guy parks the car and, and uh, when he retrieves the car he, he says, well, this is a place I haven't been to before and what's, what's your average tip that you get here? And he says, well, $25 a car. And the person, and so Bill Gates gives it to him, and he says, "Well, you must do pretty well, uh, twenty-five dollars a car." And he says, "Yeah, it's it's the first average tip I've had in years, though." So, um, you know, sometimes they're not going to give you truthful answers. Um, okay. Mark, I want to jump in here real quick. Please do. This this is Brad. I actually I really like the interview, and I think that if you have good technique and you ask open-ended questions and let the customer dictate, I actually think you can cut through a lot of that bias. Absolutely, and I'm glad you mentioned the open-ended interview. So um, it's much better to ask a question like, um, uh, not to say uh, um, something like, do you like, do you like beef, yes or no? <laughs> um, right. Instead of asking a question like that, that may be good for a follow-up or for a survey. Um, once Correct. you know that that liking beef is a really important uh, thing um, for your particular problem, but to ask open-ended questions starting out, very very helpful. Yeah, interviews are great to get the lay of the land because they they really can give you. Uh, if you ask open-ended questions, they can really give you a good idea about what the real problems are. Um, that people face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, another technique that I was trained in is if you follow up on nouns, it helps you remove some bias, and it really helps kind of uh, get in the customer's head and makes them really think and get past their initial reaction. Um, so, you know, every time they mention a noun or an adjective, just follow up on that word, and you'll eventually get to the truth. Uh, that's, that's great. That's great. So could you give us an example of that? Um, well, sure. You know, if you're asking somebody about a process, you know, I would open it up and say, okay, so we're going to be talking about this, whatever the process is, and then, and, and then you know, the first question out of the gate might be something like, what's your thoughts on this process? Mm -hmm. And then let them respond. They say, well, you know, I get here at, at 9 and I clock in, and then, you know, the first thing that I have trouble with is is uh, uh, pull a meds out of the machine and then I go to the patient and just let them talk. But every time they mention a noun, I'm going to write it down. Or every time they mention a verb, write it down. And that gives me a list to go back through and start following up on. Yeah. So once they've kind of gotten their their perspective out, now I'll go back and say, okay, now you mentioned the machine. Tell me about that machine. And so then they'll talk about that. And they're going to give you a whole other list of things to follow up on. Yeah. And, I think that's... Uh, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, and it's just a, it's a way to remove your bias from the questioning process, and it also makes sure you don't leave any gaps out. Yeah, I think that's I think that's extremely helpful. That's great advice, um, and it's also um, um, uh, a great way to get at um, really understanding what problems people are facing, because. Um, it's just like a lot of things. If you come out and ask people, what are the problems that you're facing, they're not going to tell you we have problems. They're going to say, eh, basically everything's okay. 
and so Correct. the interview ends. <laughs> so um, you know you need to ask in a way in a way that's um, that's uh, disarming to start out with, and then following up on nouns. That's a that's a, that's a great way of thinking about it. So thanks, thank I appreciate your sharing that. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, great, um, great. Okay, um, and here are just some other things that you can think about. I, I'm going to add the nouns uh, to this one, but if you're taking notes, you should add <laughs> you should add that to here. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, avoid charged or unclear words. Avoid giving possible solutions. Um, I can go on with lots of examples here. I'm going to not do that. Um, um, let's move on instead to indirect contact. Now, this is something that can also be very, very uh, powerful, but often it's a second stage. So um, indirect contact, for here I'm talking about surveys, customer evaluation forms. Now this uh, methodology is so ubiquitous that um, you, know, you can do a survey monkey or a zoomerang and uh, uh, you can get to a lot of people doing it that way. It tends to be fairly inexpensive compared to an interview on a per sample or per response basis um, and it may be easier to analyze. So if you ask people to respond to a yes or no question or to respond on a five or seven point scale called Likert scale or Likert scale uh, man's name was Likert, but I still say Likert because that's what I was taught. <laughs> um, uh, um, that um, there are some advantages to that. One is that you can get a big response, uh, you can get a big sample size. The second is you can you actually get data to analyze. Um, and the main disadvantage is that you often uh, don't ask complete questions, so you're not getting rich responses, generally speaking. Um, uh, you only get what you ask for, so if there's something that you didn't ask, uh, you can't ask the question at the end of the interview, what, what am I not asking you that's really important? <laughs> um, which is a, a question that I like to ask, um, or some form of that. Um, and um, you do have to worry about non-response bias, about the people that didn't respond, are they really different from the people who did in a fundamental way? Um, the way to think about that is, I, I, you know, I used the third rail discussion before about MSNBC uh, and, and Fox. I'm going to use it again. Um, uh, clearly, the people who are responding to their shows are not necessarily the general population. And if you care about the general population, you would do best to steer away from the results to those, to those polls. Now, if you care about the population of, let's say, uh, people who are more on the left wing, you'd probably say, hey, MSNBC polls, that tells us a little bit about what those viewers are uh, responding to. And if you were looking at people who are more in the right-wing spectrum, maybe Fox News, would t the, the results of polls from there would tell you more about that. But if you're interested in the general population, both of those polls are going to, the data are not reliable from those polls. Okay, so hopefully we're in the same, uh, hopefully that wasn't too third rail of me. Uh, okay. Fourth way is market research, and again, this is becoming easier and easier now because you can do a lot of things on the internet that you couldn't do before. A lot of um, uh, data is now available from eBay and Google and Facebook um, and, and, and Twitter that didn't used to be available. It's hard to sift through, but um, it's really pretty powerful stuff. Um, there still are these consortiums. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages, um, and the main thing I just want to point out is simply benchmarking is not process improvement. Um, so don't simply look to say, here is what everybody else is doing, and therefore we must do it. Because um, sometimes those other companies who are best in class aren't really telling you exactly how they're, how they're becoming best in class. Um, the final one I love, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful, is of becoming a customer. So uh, if you can kind of pretend you're a customer through part or all of your process, that's often very, very valuable. Now, obviously, if you're trying to reduce defects on appendectomies, you can't give yourself an appendectomy that doesn't make any sense. But if you want to sign up for a service, um, that can be something that you can try out. If you want to see how smooth the sales process is, you can call and see how the call center person handles you and see how your paperwork is handled. So all of those things can be, can be helpful. Again, it can give you an idea of, I feel your pain. Um, I'm biting my lip in the best Clinton-esque uh, impersonation I can give. Um, 
uh, yes, you can give the I feel your pain uh, perspective, which is helpful. Uh, if I guarantee you, if you're if you're going through and, and seeing how long it takes at admissions at a hospital and you wait for 30 minutes, you're going to feel the pain. Uh, or um, you know, if you get collaterals that are unreadable and you're signing up for a health insurer, you're going to feel the pain. Um, but uh, it can also be skewed, right? So you may not get the breadth of experience that's out there. I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so those are five methods of of really, I think uh, that you can that you can use, and I think that they can be very very helpful. So again, just to kind of go over that quickly, customer complaints very helpful for understanding quickly what may be defects in a project in a process, what may be things that may be hot button issues for more than a few people. Direct contacts, interviews, and focus groups. I'm also a, a huge fan of interviews particularly in an early stage, if this is the first project you're doing in an area, interviews, very powerful. Focus groups can be powerful too, but they, 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 they're actually quite high cost if you do them well. Um, and uh, indirect contact surveys, uh, comment cards, they can be helpful, but don't start out with them, I would say. Um, and the others are, I think, quite helpful. Sometimes being a customer yourself is often the most helpful because uh, it gets you into the process, uh, as Patrick said in the, in the very beginning. Makes you feel part of it. Okay, so I've got a few minutes before the top of the hour. I think what I'd like to do is, um, is I would like to, uh, I'd like to stop, um, I'd like to introduce you to the Kano model and then stop, uh, and we'll cover the Kano model, because I think next week is a little bit, um, we're going to be talking about metrics, data collection, we're going to be talking about uh, business cases. Um, I think we'll be a little bit more flexible. Um, we'll talk about Kano model, CTQ tree, VOC matrix uh, next week. Um, but I want to introduce you to the Kano model. These are all techniques for prioritizing and, and sort of hardening that customer voice. And when I mean harden, I mean specifying it more and moving us from something that's nebulous to something that's more concrete. So to give you an example of where I'm talking about we're going is, let me go back to the pizza place example. If we started out and we asked customers, what, let's say we're talking about pizza delivery, and we ask customers, what do you care about? They might say, oh, I want my pizza to be fresh. I want my pizza to be delivered fast. I want it to be hot. I want it to be tasty. Right? Now, hot and fresh and tasty and fast are all interesting. Some are more quantifiable than others. Right? So the Kano model is going to help us understand, okay, you said fresh, tasty, hot, fast. Um, which one of those or others are the most important for us to focus on. That's what the Kano model helps us understand. What are the needs, what are the wants, and what are the desires in that order of, of customers. The CTQ tree and the VOC matrix help us turn whatever those things are into metrics. So if, it's, if, if we really decide in the pizza example, hey, it's important that we have it fast, that's what our process really doesn't do well today, and we need to improve that. Well, that lends itself to an obvious to a number of obvious metrics: time that it takes us to cook the pizza, time that it takes us to collect an order, time that it takes us to collect the order between collection and delivery. All of those are viable metrics. Some are better than others. Okay, that's easy to quantify. Now, hot, that might be a little more difficult, but again, we could measure temperature at various places. That might be a way of doing it. Fresh, tasty. Those are more difficult. So the VOC matrix and the CTQ tree are tools that help us understand and, and, and sort of make more concrete what we mean by those customer uh, voice elements. I do want to take us through just a little bit on the Kano model, and then we'll stop. Um, here's what it looks like. Um, and what it is is it's a picture. And it has three. It was developed by uh, a man named Noriaki Kano or Kano, as we say here in the United States. And, um, and basically, it's a quality and satisfaction model. So um, 
let's see, let's just go here. Oops, I knew I screwed that up. Okay. So um, on the axis right here is the, is quality. So over here we have a, whatever it is that we're doing, whatever the characteristic is, it's high quality. On here, whatever the characteristic is, it's low quality. Up here, a customer is very satisfied, and down here, a customer is not satisfied. Okay, so it's a two-dimensional model. So obviously, we want to we want to be in this quadrant if we can. Okay. And just the generic of it, Kano envisioned that there were three trajectories. There were trajectories for must-haves. There are some things that we must deliver. There are trajectories for satisfiers, and there are trajectories for delighters. And the preference is simply this. If anything in a must-have is, is unsatisfied or is not of high quality, the customer is unsatisfied, period. So those are the things to nail first. Satisfiers are uh, are uh, more. Some people call them more is better, and uh, they're sort of they vary linearly. So we can actually satisfy customers and get them to be loyal by uh, by focusing on them. And then there's delighters, uh, where is, if we do them well, customers are really are super satisfied with what we do. Uh, to, let me just give you an example of that, and that is that let's take the um, um, let's take the example of a hotel. Okay, so usually when you go out and you ask customers what they want, they're going to tell you not must-haves, but they'll tell you satisfiers. Okay, so let me just go through those and say for a hotel, if you rented a hotel room, what might be for you uh, satisfiers? and must-haves, okay? And I'm just going to give, uh, what might be for me? I'll just give my answer. So, for example, a must-have in a hotel is uh, a towel, <laughs> okay? I need to have towels. I need to have a pillow. I need to have soap in the room. I need it to be relatively clean. Those are things I need to have a bed, okay? I certainly, I don't even notice it if they're there, right? I don't notice. I, I don't say, hey, great. There's toilet paper in the in the bathroom. Isn't that awesome? I don't say that. What I do is it just marginally satisfies me, right? That's it. I'm not I'm not delighted or anything like that. Satisfiers might be things like how long does it take me to check in? So I want a quick check-in time. Or I want a very clean room. Or I want certain services available to me. Or I want certain services available to me late at night. Those would be satisfiers. And then delighters would be things that I probably wouldn't even think of that, uh, that uh, are, are met. Okay? So those are the things. Um, those are the, that's just kind of the common definition of what they are. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk through that a little bit more next time. But I'd like to stop here, and, um, and uh, we'll, we'll cover the Kano model, we'll cover CTQ trees, and we'll cover... Um, uh, we'll cover the voice of customer matrix when we meet next time. Okay, so I do want to stop at this point, and, and um, we'll uh, we'll just talk a little bit about the prep for the next session. The next session should be um, Tuesday at uh, same time, same bat time, same bat place, and um, I think all of you should have the link to that. Um, there is an assignment that's uh, that's due on Tuesday, uh, John. For you, that's it's it's reading, um, which should be fairly straightforward. Most of this we've covered, um, and um, and uh, for Brad and and Patrick and Sue and Shani, it's it's the exercises and the working together. I I do want to mention that um, if you haven't yet done the collaborative work. Um, make the schedules as soon as you can. See so if you you know reach out and make sure you have some time to talk with people. Okay, so that's about it. If you have any questions, um, I am uh, I'm not going anywhere. So uh, so uh, I'll be I'll be on the line for a little bit if you want to stay. If you don't, we're done. And uh, I just want to say have a great great weekend. And uh, I do appreciate your time, as always. I appreciate it today. 
and um, hopefully I can avoid the technical difficulties next time. That was not fun for me, but uh, and I don't know why I had them have it after having checked them right before. But I'll look into it. I'll have to find the root cause. <laughs> okay, operator error is probably the root cause. <laughs> um, okay. Well, anyway, thanks, guys, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Mark.